This week on the Baseline Podcast, Josh and I are breaking down the Super Bowl. We are talking to everything from the halftime performances to the first quarter to the fourth quarter, everything in between, and also talking about is there truly a script in the National Football League. Then we also break down some more coaching changes in college football and how Chip Kelly is somehow the offense coordinator for Ohio State. All that and so much more coming up on the Baseline Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Baseline Podcast. I'm Ben, that's Josh, and we are here. We are live after the Super Bowl, the craziness of the Super Bowl, all the drama-filled, nuts things that happen, uh, but we are here, uh, and it is still for some reason feeling like it's March and not February, but that is what it is. Uh, Josh, how was your weekend? Um, did you get much sleep at all, or have you been just working your life away? This was my weekend to work, but I still managed to get uh, still some good sleep in. Uh, because That's of good. that, though, did miss the first quarter of the big game, but yeah. obviously nobody scored, so I didn't really miss a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, I true. stayed up late watching uh, the overtime later than I, what I would have liked, though. But other than that, yes, yeah, how weekend we've been uh, having 40-ish degree temperatures so weird. over here. Yeah, So weird. So, yeah, we had a solid weekend over here. How was uh, the weekend out in Hungary? You know, it is, it is, it's about the same as Ohio. It's been like fifties, which is even weirder for me, but um, no, it's been good. Uh, I, I had a long weekend cause they have ski breaks over here. I know we didn't really have those growing up, you know, in Ohio, but it's just funny to me every Still time. Cracks like, me up, yeah. It is. It's funny because like, as a teacher, I'm like awesome two days where I get to, you know, not have students, but it's also like weird. It's like when I was a kid, like I would have never thought we'd miss school because of ski breaks. Um, but yeah, so so that was uh, fascinating. Uh, had some good meetings and uh, had some good, good just time of break. So yeah, and then obviously I didn't really watch the Super Bowl. I watched the highlights the next day, partly because it started at like twelve thirty in the morning my time, and I'm like I have to work the next day. So um, yeah, that is the on one that, disadvantage. On that note, um, I mean I know the NFL is trying to grow popularity yeah. in Europe. Is the Super Bowl a big deal over there? And it, do you know anybody that actually watched it? Yeah, like I know like a lot of the football guys. I know like are actually our football club. Like they hosted something at like a a, a bar slash restaurant like to watch the game. Um, but I also know I know a lot of um, you know either former players or people that watch the NFL or at least or at least like love watching big sporting events. I know people that watched it, you know, online. I know like even the Hungarian uh, sports network, I believe had a Hungarian like commentary over the game. I know Germany does that. Germany had like actual people at the Super Bowl. They had like their whole, you know, crew. But yeah, it's hmm. become bigger. Actually, it was it was actually advertised uh, like at some bars around Budapest. Like you could come watch the 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 Super Bowl. Um, so I, I think that's kind of cool. It, it was kind of a, uh, you know, a lot of the players were telling me they were really excited to watch it. So I think it's becoming bigger. I think, especially if you were in, I bet if you were in Germany or in like England, I think you would have seen, I think more people obviously talking about it and watching it for sure. That's just crazy. Cause it's like, it's getting over at f around 4am over there, your time. And mm -hmm. I'm assuming most of them have work. Yeah. Monday I mean, morning it, as well. It is crazy to think about. I mean, actually, I was thinking about like even people in Australia, you know, it's like 10 a.m. when the game starts. So like, do, do the people like, do they just get out of work? Like, how does this work? Like take a ski break, you know, I guess I guess for them, it's like summer. So I guess it'd be take like a summer vacation, I guess. But um, yeah, it's really fascinating. But I, hey, it's it's cool to see the game spread and, and to see like more former NFL coaches are coming to coach in the European leagues. You're seeing uh, college coaches literally leaving college games college you know jobs to come coach in the prof the top professional league here in europe so it's really cool to see for sure all right well why don't we dive into yeah, uh, it. the big game and talk yes. about i guess things that you noticed or what you read yeah. and i'll just go ahead and give my initial thoughts from what i watched in the last three quarters in overtime i know patrick mahomes got the mvp and this is his third super bowl and that's you know the i mean the awards as far as that goes but to me i thought kansas city's defense was yeah, the deciding really factor yeah. in here just with the way that pinnell and chris jones and mcduffie were making plays it seemed like in all the big moments i mean chris jones with that pressure on purdy to stop him from throwing what could have been a game winning touchdown and then they had to settle for a field goal which opened up the opportunity for pat to be able to march down and get the game winning touchdown try to begin with you can look at the the blocked extra point uh in regulation that would have given the 49ers 20 points in regulation. Obviously, yeah. that 
affected the way that the game was called from there and just per yeah Purdy never seemed to like be able to be totally comfortable in no. the pocket and uh, to me this is I mean the 49ers defense had a heck of a night too uh getting at Pat I thought too and holding them to I guess it would have been 19 in regulation too but really a a lower scoring game than what I had predicted uh maybe I was actually slightly, pretty close I was you pretty were close almost to... you were almost on it yeah you were really close but to me the the defense for Kansas City was uh, huge in this game. And, I mean, that was kind of the story of this Kansas City team all season long. Yeah, you know, it is funny that I was wrong again with my prediction, which seems to be just the case for me this year. I told you, there's absolutely no way, whether it's rigged or not, that the NFL is letting the Chiefs lose this game. I'm yeah. just – I did not throw any money on it. I thought about doing something wild like throwing my week's paycheck on it just so I could double it with the plus 100, but didn't do it. Didn't do it. So maybe I truly didn't believe what I was saying anyways. No, it, it is fascinating. And, you know, I, I do agree with you. I think both defenses played well. I think Brock Purdy, I don't want to say the moment was too big for him because I, I don't think that's right. I, I just feel that he was, I think, a little overwhelmed with just the game itself. So I, I don't. I think he was ready for it. I just think they're like you could tell Pat Mahomes has been there. You could oh, tell yeah. Pat has Fourth been there. Fourth Super Bowl versus first and, Super Bowl. And I just think like a seventh year versus a second year. Exactly. I I just think that, you know, the 49ers, like with all the talent they have on that offensive side of the ball, um, I just I felt like they just lacked something. And again, the line offensive line did not play well, which we had said all we said, even coming up to the game, like they had struggled against even decent pass rushes. You know, look what the Browns did to them way back at the beginning of the season. You know, the Browns just ate them alive. So for me, I just, I, I think I was just, it, it was tough to see Brock go through that, obviously. Um, now, do I think the Chiefs dominated? No. Like, I, I think the Chiefs did what they had to and put themselves in a great position to win. Um, because I think we saw, we saw what happened. We've seen, we're seeing now that with Travis Kelsey getting older, they've got to find a, a go-to guy. Like, that's not a guy that you know you go to him like every single play because let's be honest, Charles Kelsey's gonna be 34, like he's not getting any younger. Um, I think that's one thing we did notice about the Chiefs, at least I did. Like they need to find a guy that they can just rely on, you know, wholeheartedly. But other than that, I think we have great. yeah, the guys they do have, we can talk about all the mistakes that Tony had all season long. Yeah. Pacheco had, I think, two fumbles in this game alone, recovered one of them. But yeah, there was just not as much offensive firepower as the past Kansas City Chiefs. So younger Travis Kelsey, you get uh, Tyree Kill in there, and the mix of running backs that they've had come through that have been yeah. solid too. I know McKinnon was solid in the receiving game too at one point. Uh, one other thing too, uh, the, the injuries on the 49ers side too. I don't know how much this really – swayed the final score but yeah. seeing Greenlaw like with that oh dude that was awful injury, dude I felt so bad for him it's just like you gotta be Kimi they showed the replay I was like he is not injured right now there's like some there's kind a of sniper it was a like, sniper <laughs> like <laughs> not even necessarily a sniper but it's just like he fell down like because of something else right like yeah and then it's like the Achilles and then I know Debo had the injury but came back into the game later and had, obviously probably wasn't 100 percent himself there but just two big blows of the 49ers. Just... And also the fact that Shanahan can't seem to coach victories when he's up big. It's just it's starting to starting to be a, a pattern here. It's yeah, I was gonna pattern. actually make a point on that too. Yeah. And I don't know that the 49ers are really all that up big in this game. Uh we had mentioned 10, that that was it. Yeah. We had mentioned that they, they can't fall behind in this one like they did with the Packers and the and the Lions games, because it's like the Chiefs are a team that didn't I mean, you can't when they fall smell blood them. when they smell yeah. blood, then they will, they'll capitalize. And they kept it close enough to, yep. uh, like you said, put themselves in position at the end. But yeah, Kyle Shanahan now is as a head coach in these two Super Bowls against the Chiefs has been outscored 46 to nothing in the uh, fourth quarter and overtime. I believe it is. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. As a coach, I don't know if that also includes the, the 28 to three blown lead against the Patriots when he was offensive coordinator at the Falcons, but it's just like, dang, man, it, it was something that I wanted to bring up last week too, is just like the past of Kyle Shanahan, just for whatever reason, f struggling to score late in games. And that obviously yeah. that is a situation that came to bite him in the butt too. And it was very weird. I, I saw a video today that showed like John Elway giving the Super Bowl trophy. And it was like, 
John Elway was coached by Shanahan's dad, and now he has to give the trophy to the opposite team that just like I just I think that was just like almost like a nail into Shanahan's coffin. Like, hey, well, a division rival you know, too. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, so it's just to me, man. I just. I, I just felt like the 49ers, it felt like after they got that lead, they are like, oh, we have this in the bag. Was that just me, or did you feel that too? I felt like when they got that lead, and they were like, oh, I think we we, we have this. I think I think we have a good shot. Like, at least that's what I, the vibe I grabbed from the, from the game. It could have been what they thought, but the whole time I'm watching, I'm like, how is Kansas City going to come back and win this game? Mm. That's what I was waiting for. And then for most of the game, if, like, if I didn't know any better, I'd been watching the game like, wow, San Francisco is going to actually get this. I, I could have been wrong. The yeah. good thing I didn't put any bets on this game or anything like that. And well, I saw someone lost like 20K and then broke his TV. So, you know, life of betting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a dangerous game sometimes. But like I said, this one it just seemed like Kansas City, there's no way that they're gonna lose this game. And San Francisco never played well enough that I felt comfortable. They never built a big enough yeah. lead that I felt comfortable and just like we were saying, Kansas City lingered around just enough. Uh and then on top of all that, I, that was kind of just because of the the Taylor Swift effect, right? Like the NFL has the opportunity to cement all this new demographic as fans, and we had record viewership first off, so I think that played Which into it. I want to clear up that this was not about the football is the viewership, and if anybody that fights me on that, I'm going to totally tell you, prove to it me. It was not about this. the football, yeah. Cringe There's halftime no show, I seen videos on Instagram of that. Sure. I didn't even watch that. I took the opportunity to go ahead and shower from work during the halftime show glad I missed that and then just yeah all the all the shots up to all the celebrities and just it just it, it like uh, the non the non football stories that it, that football fans didn't care about but for, does it bother like I you, said does it bother you though that like I feel like at least with like major league baseball and even the NBA to an extent like they focus on the game like they actually try to like explain what's happened in the game I just feel like the NFL even before Taylor Swift, even in the last few years, it's just become this like, how do we make a narrative out of a game? It's like, it's a game. Like, there is no narrative. Like, you can, it's two teams winning to try to win the game. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? No. Try again. So, my, my question is, do you, do you feel like, like, how, how, like, how frustrating is it? for you to watch NFL games now, even before Taylor Swift, but how frustrating is it you like, do you like, have you lost joy at like turning on the Super Bowl? Like, did you like, were you hesitant to go, do I even want to watch this? For me, it's a different story because it's the time, but like for you to be able to sit down, were you like, do I really want to watch this? Did that ever cross your mind? This was the first year that I really didn't care about the matchup all that much, but even in the past, like the last year, the Chiefs Eagles, I thought was interesting. I thought the, the Bengals and the Rams, but I mean, sports it always seems like they got some kind of a narrative, right? Like on the 49ers side, it was Brock Purdy being Mr. Irrelevant and getting to a Super Bowl in his second Yo, no, season. I, Nobody's I, ever I, supposed I'm to okay make this that. far. I'm talking about like the, when they create narratives out of people that are watching the game that are at the game. Okay. Or like the terrorists. That's what I'm trying to say. The not stuff narr- that's not game. Yeah. Related. Not narrative, not narratives that are like game related. It's fine. Like guys coming back after a year long injury. That's great. I love those stories. It's like when they're trying to generate something that has no effect on the game and it has no impact on the game whatsoever. Yeah, That's I, think, I think sure. the, the NFL recognizes that they are the most uh, watched TV product, period. Not just in sports, but yeah. on most, like every national uh, television channel, it seems like their most watched program ever is an NFL game. And they're trying to cash in on that with the extra audience that they do have that might not necessarily be watching for the football games. Whereas... We see with the World Series and the NBA Finals, even it seems like viewership's going down, and you got to bet that those people that are still watching are the true fans. So it's like yeah. catering to your audience. Yeah. And then this 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 year, yeah, like I I was saying, they they had a much uh they had an opportunity to cement a new demographic as permanent NFL fans from this, and I mean they got the the outcome that they wanted, but I don't I don't think you can point to any one call or penalty or any like that was weird moment no. like. Regardless of how you feel about how the Chiefs got here up to this point, I think the 49ers game, it was it was a flat out like, yeah, they were the better team in the game. Yeah, and I mean the 49ers didn't know the rules in the in the overtime, which I still think is funny. Um would you have gone uh with getting the ball first in overtime or would you have deferred? No, gone for I would have got the ball first. Uh one hundred one thousand percent. You take your you take the shot. Like go ahead and take the shot. 
Yeah, and... I've I was talking to my barber about that today because in o- the playoffs, the overtime rules do change. Each team does get at least one possession, yeah. so it's not like a touchdown cements you as the winner. Yeah, but I, I think it gives you that that, that edge. I've always felt like in overtime, you if you can get the ball first, you take the ball first. And like make that other team have to then earn it, right? Like if you go down and score a touchdown, now that other team knows they have, yeah, they know they have to score a touchdown, but it, it's almost that much harder because now it's putting pressure on them to actually get a touchdown. Where if you don't have to worry about that, you're just going down again, whatever points are given to you. And there's no like, you know, they can't guess what you're doing necessarily all the time. Yeah. On the one counter argument, and I thought Tony Romo had brought up a good point, is that when you are the second team and you know what you got to do, like on that uh, fourth down where they're on their own 30, they get an extra down technically because they're not punting on fourth down. Yeah. If they haven't scored a touchdown yet, they're going for it. So they get a fourth play to get, you know, those 10 yards. And had Kansas City had that drive first and they get like that fourth and three on their own 30, they're probably punting it away right there because you're not going to well, risk yeah, failing probably, and giving yeah, yeah. San Francisco the ball in field goal range already. Yeah. So I, I can see the benefits yeah. of, like you said, going for it first and trying to get a touchdown. Or waiting so you know exactly what you have to do, and then you can call plays accordingly. At the end of the day, you're relying on your defense, right? Like you're relying on that that team that that defense. That, I trust that my gets defense. You there. Like I got yeah, you. exactly. So, yeah, for me, but like going back to the Taylor Swift thing, like, look, it is what it is, and I know a lot of football fans are really frustrated because they feel like most of these new fans like have no no idea about football. They might know little bits. Um, and it can be frustrating. Like I, I get it because it just feels like it's just not genuine fans but i do feel like at the end of the day that you know the game was won in a, in a positive way like do you know and i i joked on our on our in on our story i said like you know it this truly is feels like it's rigged right and i think it sucks for a lot of us pure football fans who are like dang it i just wanted like one thing not to go a you know celebrity way or or a or a a, a win way. for the fo- the real football fans yeah the 49ers but, we're counting on you but i think at the end like you know does this relationship last past this year it'll be very interesting to see you'll you'll be able to tell in the next few months if it was for if it was for views or if it was for uh, like a real like you know two people that are really you know obviously care about each other which i i you know for his sake i hope it's it's for the latter but again um maybe you can agree with me on that or not but i think that will be the telltale sign of like how you know real this season truly was i guess i did run a poll on my instagram because i was curious what people thought after the final uh out of 30 votes 23 said the game is rigged or the nfl's rigged i mean it's really hard not to believe that when literally taylor swift's boyfriend's team wins like it's really hard not to like. I did. I did find it interesting who was saying yes and no though. So all the no's, it's not rigged. Were like diehard NFL fans that really want to believe hilarious. that it's that it's real. And on the other end, the ones that were saying yes were either not Me. sports fans, casuals, or they had a team that might have gotten screwed in the playoffs or yeah. in the regular season somehow, and they feel a little butt hurt maybe about it no but. like i want to believe no like honestly josh <laughs> i want to believe that that the game is pure and there is no and like again i don't think there is um but would it put it would it surprise me if the nfl would decide to maybe influence to help themselves a little financially no because i know the world we live in so um i don't think it's happening uh, again if it comes out 25 years from now that it did happen it also wouldn't surprise me, um, but at the end of the day, I, I think it's still it's kind of a fun, funny story, I guess, in, in a, a weird way. It just you know, you look at Travis Kelsey and you're like, interesting. Um, but I know, yeah. Go ahead and say what you want, and then I want to bring up the last topic I want to talk about. Yeah, my final thoughts on whether the NFL's rigged or not. I want to clarify when I say rigged, I don't mean that like George Kittle and. Brock Purdy and Christian McCaffrey are in on it, and they're going to lose yeah, the no, game yeah, somehow. Yeah, of course, I understand. Yeah, I understand. I'm talking about all those small things that we were talking about last week, like the Chiefs getting to train on the Raiders facility mm-hmm. and the 49ers having to be on, like, UNLV's Crappy under field. construction field and fire alarms going off randomly and the 49ers hotels waking everybody up, like, before they would like. And the what's those small calls that you see in some of those regular season games that go the Chiefs' way, the refs, the refs clearly – and maybe these wouldn't have swayed games or not, but not making Patrick Mahomes set out plays when he had to change his equipment because his helmet broke or that one safety Sneed or whatever his name is that took yeah. his helmet off and argued with the ref. And 
didn't get a 15 yard on sportsman like conduct penalty for that and stuff like that it's like those are the things that i'm talking about yeah of course yeah yeah no and i i agree like i think i think that the there are times where it's like all right if you're going to be equal like be equal on both sides and i think sometimes that it yeah. might seem like it's not um and again we're nick picking again like congrats to the chiefs like they, they won it all but i did want to bring up something that i thought um i guess for both of us we could talk about what is your thoughts on the Travis Kelsey situation on the sideline with with Andy Reid? I know they both kind of laughed it off at the end, which I guess is mm-hmm. not surprising since it was a Super Bowl win. If it was a loss, I think it, I could go the other way. Um, the Crane and Company had a really interesting thoughts on it. Um, I want to hear your thoughts, and then I'll share mine. But like, how do you feel about it? Because I definitely am pretty strong about about where I where I stand on it. I mean, on one end, it's like, okay, that's that's superstar privilege, right? Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid, I'm sure, have a really good relationship. And so there's that trust there where... And the relationship with one, his brother, Jason, so... Yeah, so like a, an incident like that is not going to like make you question whether or not Travis yeah. Kelsey is going to be a Kansas City Chief next year or not, for one. But then, two, it's like, Travis, the whole reason you're not on the field right now is because you can't block like George Kittle. Or like some of these other tight ends that we talk about, you're a great receiver, but this was a running play, and they wanted the tight end that they thought was better at blocking on the field. And to begin your with. own now, brother says you suck at blocking. Your own brother. <laughs> and obviously, the the block wasn't made anyways, and Pacheco fumbled the ball. And you can argue about whose fault it was. Pacheco should have held on, or if Kelsey being on the field would have made a difference. But that's the whole. Like I understood the situation completely, and I would have done that situation too. But obviously, Travis is going to feel a certain type of way about it and be confident in himself that he would have made a better play. But that's my takeaway. I, I didn't read into it too much. I did think it was hilarious, though, like seeing all the memes afterwards and stuff. And even in the moment, I was just like, oh, my gosh, man. Like, how many times do you see, like, a guy slapping, like, the playbook out of a coach's hand yeah. or something like that? I guess I take a little different side. I guess my side, I'll, I'll be honest, is that look, whether you're frustrated or not, like, okay, I get it. You know, you guys get paid a lot of money. It's, it is what it is. I know you want to be in there, but like I do agree with you. Like you're a crappy blocker. Your own brother has said that on your, his own podcast. Like he's, you know, they talked about if Travis could play center, and Jason's like Travis, you don't like blocking, right? So that makes sense. Uh, I guess my biggest frustration is, you know, there's 123 million people that have watched this game. How many of those are kids that are play football or high school players? Um, I don't know about you, Josh, but I think it sets a really bad precedent when it's one thing to bump into your coach or yell at him. Like, again, I think that's disrespectful as a coach myself, but I, okay, like whatever, you know, that's fine. But the whole like grabbing his arm thing to me and bumping him, like, I don't care what they said after the game in that moment. I I think it gives a real bad precedent to players, to young players that look, I can say what I want. I can do what I want. Um, Again, this is my take. This is coming from someone who not only coaches, but, you know, I've been a player and like, I just know like what my parents would have expected of me. And again, I'm not saying anything about Travis as a person. I just think it's just a really hard look. I think when you have a lot of little kids that are now going to model themselves after the way you play and, and it's, it's how you hold yourself up in the, in the tough and stressful moments as well. But um, again, that's my take. I just, I'm very like disappointed that, you know, at least after the game, they, he didn't address it in a different way, a way. Maybe, you know, maybe he doesn't feel sorry for it, but maybe encouraging young guys like, hey, this is not what you do. But um, that's my take. Does that make sense? I, I tried to make it as clear as possible. I follow you. And I, and I just think like I was getting at is that's just kind of the difference between high school and, and oh, I know I get it. No, I get that. But a lot of these kids don't get that. And that's that's the because I saw it when I coached in, in America, like some of these kids will follow to what the professional does to a T. Um, and again, I, I think it, that, I guess the same thing, like with baseball, right? Like if you got a guy that's just always going to argue, yell and, and get thrown out, like it's, it, you know, people that model their game, like t- sometimes the kids don't think and they just do what they, what they've seen. So again, I agree with you. I'm not saying like, I, I think it's, you know, I, I would, if I, if I wasn't a coach, I'd probably see it more in your light, maybe a little bit. I still would feel frustrated about the way he did it, but um, yeah, I guess I just, you do do see a, you do see talented kids at the high school level, get, get that treatment. Like, like teachers will give them passing grades if they're struggling so they can be eligible to play or if they're going to go to a D one school 
uh, the coaches will will do what they can to make sure they get there because then it looks good on their program to have put somebody yeah. at that level and stuff. So and if you do that to kids and give them that treatment, then they do start to learn like, OK, because of this talent, I can get away with things and do what I want. Yeah, it's just hard, I guess, as like as a coaching perspective, like it's very hard to then teach that 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 player or the other players that see that player doing that. Does that make sense? So I, I think it's that's the hard thing is because like what if a young you know let's say a that's why it's that's why it's that important at the youth level to to not be that way because if you yeah. do have one wide receiver for example that can do that stuff it sets a precedent for the other wide receivers that we don't have to practice as hard or we can act this way and get away with it whereas the pros it's it's obvious like the superstars that even get in trouble with the law they'll they'll get another shot like your your cream hunts or antonio brown as much as he did because there's talent there and it can help you win games and NFL and they'll overlook those things and it's a business and it's you know all those other things whereas it's just it's just a different level to it I guess no yeah and I agree with you I again I I, I but think, I follow your logic yeah so I I just think that like I guess my advice to any young person listening that is playing a sport is like hey let's just you know if you're upset like you pull a coach aside and you talk to him like that's the, I think that's the more professional thing to do as a professional athlete. I think that was my biggest thing is like you're a professional athlete, hand it like professionals, not grabbing your coach, almost knocking the old guy over, right? And um, but again, I, I hats off to the Chiefs. Again, I have nothing against Travis Kelsey or anything. He's you know he's an Ohio kid. I just think that you know that's the difference. I guess between you know I guess when you have eighteen million a year versus making nothing. Um, so again, I, I think that's just my opinion. Um, let's see here. Final question, maybe about the mm -hmm. teams that were involved in the Super Bowl. Yeah, we've seen windows be very short lived in the NFL. I mean, look yeah. at the Eagles; they yeah, they make the exactly. Super Bowl last yeah. year and then they they fall off a cliff this season. Um, the Rams win a Super Bowl and then completely fall off a cliff the next year, and they scrapped a little bit of things and had a little bit more health this year, so they're able to make it back actually this year. But mm -hmm. it just seems like you you only got a short window. But the Chiefs now this is. Their fourth Super Bowl with Pat and their third victory. How much more do you see the Kansas City uh, dynasty now? Definitely at this point is what it is going on. Look, I think it relies a lot on how long does Coach Reed want to coach? It's one, right? I, I think we'd be we'd be really led wrong if we think that this is just Pat Mahomes. Like I believe Andy Reed is a very, very, if not one of the, he's in the top. I think eight coaches all time i i really i really love andy reed and like what he's done for the game of football um I'm, it's a shame he didn't win a super bowl in in philly uh, all those nfc championship game appearances yeah. and yeah just it's tough to see that because i think he 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 deserved that and the way he kind of left was kind of a sour taste but um no i think it number one it depends on him i think number two it depends on you know obviously Mahomes' health but i think to me one of the biggest maybe like that no one talks about is what are you going to do at skill position? Honestly, like I think this year they were blessed that the 49ers offense struggled and their defense stepped up. What happens if the 49ers offense doesn't really struggle and their defense is like, okay, like you're in a big worry of her because again, like I said, Travis Kelsey, he's not going to play forever. He might play for, I'm guessing another three years, maybe four, maybe at max. Um, obviously you have Mahomes locked up, but I think you need to, you need to figure that thing out. And again, so I'm going to say, I think I can see them winning probably another two Super Bowls, I think in the next, you know, five years or so. So I, I again, I I don't know if it's going to be as dominant as the Patriots. I think it's going to be very close. Again, it, it relies on the health of Pat Mahomes and it relies on, can they get players that fit what they want, um, but also not losing that extra uh, oomph that, that it means to, to win uh, a Super Bowl. And then following that up here, this is obviously the 49ers' second Super Bowl appearance in four years, and they got all the superstars they do. Yeah. And now in this offseason, we're going to have to be talking about how much you're going to pay Brock Purdy. And a big reason why they can have all those superstars is because Purdy ain't even making a million dollars. Yeah. How much longer can the 49ers maintain this pace and keep this group together? To me, I think... I do agree with basically everything you said about Kansas City. I think yeah. it does come down to how long Reed wants to be there and how healthy Kelsey can keep himself and stuff like that. Yeah. I think with the 49ers, it's a lot less of a window. I think you're you're in more of like a, a cracked door. Um, I, I think, look, even if you pay Purdy, 
right? And maybe he takes a little bit of a discount. Maybe he tries to work with you or whatever. That, that's fine. You're going to have to then repay Bosa coming up soon. Like Ayuk, Kittle, uh, Samuel, like all these guys, plus your offensive line that you're going to try to keep together, your defense you're going to try to keep together. I, I'm saying that they maybe they make the Super Bowl next year or maybe the year after that, but I, I don't – I, it's going to be very hard for me to sit here and go, they're going to win a Super Bowl, at least one Super Bowl, and they're going to make you know multiple Super Bowls. I, I just think their window is a lot tighter than the Chiefs, partly because we've seen the Chiefs actually succeed. We've seen the 49ers get there, and then they just they kind of fold. So for me, I, maybe if they get one next year, then maybe, okay, maybe I change my mind. But I, I really think that it comes down to can they have consistency um, and can they keep those guys in wraps the best they can? Yeah, I'm trying right now to figure out who all is going to be under contract next year right now or who they're going to have to. I think all take. pretty much all their big names, for the most part, I believe, are signed. I'm pretty sure. I was say, didn't they just give Bosa a record yeah, deal? Yeah, they just gave him one. That's what I was saying. And like I In th- the next few years, he'll, he'll be up. But I got gotcha. you. Let's see here. I believe Ayuk's going to need one, I think, coming up. I think. Yeah. They've paid Fred Warner. They've paid Trent Williams. Debo did get paid. Um, looks like Kittle has gotten paid recently. Uh, next year, he's due to make uh, uh, $19 million, it looks like. You're also going to have like, CMC. you got to pay CMC if you want to keep him McCaffrey is getting near the end of his deal because he yeah. signed that deal when he was still in Carolina. Yep. Let's see here. Uh, they are going to have to pay Greenlaw soon, it looks like. Yeah, but then do you want to pay with him with that Achilles injury? Like, right? There's so many questions. Yeah, it's tough to come out. back from Achilles, man. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but it is going to be tough. It, it's always tough to maintain that. But the good thing about the 49ers is that they seem to be really good at developing and drafting. That's that's one thing that this front office, I, with the exception of the, the Trey Lance situation, I'd yeah. say they've done pretty well making things work as far as money goes and getting guys sure. in the building that can play. Agreed. But, yeah, you just – you look at the way the other team's windows are sometimes, and I would have felt good about the Eagles coming into this season. They definitely started off that way, but, yeah, once you got a team, you got to, like, win now. And it really does help if you got well, a quarterback on a rookie contract. And that's what, like, you know, you see the Browns. That's what the Browns are trying to do, right, is just – build as much as they can over the next couple of years while Chubb is still kind of in a, in a peak spot. And some of these other guys, um, I think it's, it's easier. And let's say like baseball or these kind of sports where I think you over time or soccer, like you don't have to be great every year. You just have to be in that ballpark. Um, whereas football, I feel like you have to go for it. If you really, really want to keep, you know, your team together. For sure. So I'm curious what you think about this since you mentioned it, commercials and how they've gone downhill. Did you have a favorite Super Bowl ad from this year? No. I'll be honest. The closest I can get to calling favorite was the Paramount Plus one because they had Creed make an appearance on it. I just struggle with the ads because I I just I, I think maybe it's the nostalgia of like some of the amazing ads that you and I had when we were kids. Like it, it's just like they've gotten away from like the cheesy, have fun go to ads, and there's always a like, not all of them, but I feel like some of them have a very very strong like political message they want to put out, and it's like that's not what the ads are for. Oh, speaking of politics too, I I was a fan of the RFK ad too for not oh, for well, comedy or anything reasons. Yeah. It was just like oh look at Robert Kennedy getting in on the action. His Love vo- it. His voice drives me nuts. I I try not to use that, but it's the just bro like, was injured by vaccines. Man, it was. come on. No, no, I don't mean it in a bad way. I like <laughs> I, I mean it in a general like I, I try to like not focus on it so I can I can hear his it message. is hard that when if you when you hear him talk like for a long time, like even on his appearance with Joe Rogan, it sounds like he's getting ready to cry every time he talks. Yeah. Because I believe it was, right? It was like a it was I forget what it was. Well, it was, it was like, a was vaccine younger. injury related thing. Was yeah. it what is that's why he he's younger? such a Yeah, that that's why he's such a big advocate like against them and showing like how they're made and developed and stuff like that. That's a, a big reason for his platform is because he's been yeah. a victim of it himself. Yeah. Which is very fascinating. So 
Um, but yeah, I for anybody that just took that the wrong way, y'all listen, y'all jerks. I don't mean it in a way I don't like his voice. What I'm saying is, is it's very hard. Ben to doesn't like, like listen, people with disabilities. Listen through, all right? Listen through. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, no, going back to the ads. Yeah, I just then like the Jesus ad or whatever. I don't he even gets know. us. Yeah, they they uh, dropped the ball on that one. But that's that whole campaign basically is yeah left wing agenda stuff. Again, so so what I guess what I was going back to say is like. Josh, it's really hard for me to enjoy an ad when I know you have a reasoning behind it. What made the old ads when we were kids so good is that you really didn't. What was the point of it? You had there was no point. It was just fun, and I and I miss those truly. I do. Snickers was always clutch. Doritos was oh, always clutch. Monster always had a good one. The Budweiser, uh, Clydesdale, nostalgia oh, ones, and even Taco Bell had good ones, right? Or like you know Burger King, you know McDonald, like just fun, like Super Bowl related. And then, you know, you move on. Like, I, I uh, one of my favorite is like, uh, I am a farmer, I think it is. Uh, it was that, you know, the one, I think it was back in like 2012, maybe. Uh, or like, this is a farmer. And it was uh, Paul Harvey doing it, which was, was, was fun. Oh, yes. So. Um, Vaguely remember that. But yeah, so the, yeah, to answer your question, I thought they were all trash. So, to be. Yeah, honest. I'm. The only ones that I can really remember, like like I said, the Paramount one because Creed popped up. That was probably the most uh, exciting thing that happened during watching the Super Bowl was we saw – so I should clarify first. I was watching it by myself, and I had friends that were watching it by their self, but yeah. we were texting during the game. And I, seen the Paramount, <laughs> and I seen the Paramount Plus ad, and they had Creed like pop up on there. And then like 10 minutes later after that, group chat message from one of my friends, uh, Riley, if you're listening. Thank you, bud. Uh, sends a post with extended tour dates for Creed's reunion tour. So they got shows in like October, November, December now, and they're playing a show in Cleveland. There you we go. were debating about going four hours down to Cincinnati to watch their show in July, but now they got a show in Cleveland. We're no, like, you're like, oh, they're right. We literally bought the tickets right then and there. There you go. <laughs> eight of there them. Eight of us are going to go and watch in November. <laughs> and lose your minds. Um, Lose our minds, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it, uh, yeah, so it was... Eh. I don't really care anymore about the commercials, to be honest. I just make I I like the people that love them, and then I just give them a hard time, which is usually what I like to do now, just to yeah, annoy them. There's there's really not yeah. I feel like our kids are gonna grow up and not be tor like tortured. Yeah, that's what. It's gonna well, be. not not be tortured, but it's just like the Super Bowl ads aren't gonna mean the same thing to them. Like we're gonna tell them like you know they used to be really good back. <laughs> you know when they we were used kids. to be really. And good. they're gonna be like whatever, Dad. Every other one's <laughs> like. Like has like you said an agenda or a narrative to it or just not just good ridiculous. or unoriginal, uncreative. And they're gonna be like, they or the worst is like when you can like look at them and you can literally see like the old commercial. They've just like rebranded it, which just makes it the worst. Like makes it worse. It's like I've seen this ad non Super Bowly, and you just added Super Bowl stuff to make it different. That's usually what I get annoyed about. It's like, uh, huh? Yeah. We're going to be telling them that football used to, like, you could actually hit the quarterback back in the day. The commercials used to be funny. And they're going to be like, whatever, Dad. They play with flags now, and the, the ads are mid. Yeah, there's there's so many jokes we could run with. It's just phenomenal. There is. There's, like, and you're going to have, like, the one, like, one person per team has to be a girl. Like, it just, like, it's a kind of like soccer. There's like, like the Rooney limit. rule, but yeah. with women. That has to be. It's just, <laughs> The th scary part uh, is like we're joking about this. It's like honestly, they have the Pro Bowl playing with flags already. Yeah. So honestly, we're I not love far watching away. on my Instagram during Pro Bowl week plays of like, like Sean Taylor, like just leveling Brian Norman on a fake punt, or, <laughs> I loved or it. Randy Moss like Moss and somebody. And it's like Randy Moss played in a Pro Bowl. How about that? Because they actually cared about having fun. And not about Imagine this fun. too. Like we were just making jokes about what our kids are going to say about Super Bowl commercials and football in general, but. Let them know, like, yeah, Randy Moss, I remember seeing him in the Pro Bowl, and they're going to be like, the Pro Bowl isn't for the best players, Dad. It's for the third stringers, like Gardner <laughs> Minshew. That they're like, nope, Randy Bowl. Moss did play in it, and they're going to be like, he used to be a third <laughs> string what... wide receiver, and we're going to be like, no, he was the best. That's what bothers me is, like, the Pro Bowl's just become, like, what is, like, the the annoying dude on your team that you just think is good because he started a few games, and now you get to send him off Gardner Minshew Bowl. being a Pro Bowl quarterback, man. It's, Can't believe and it. And it's, it's like Tyler Huntley. Like the dude played three games and then was a Pro Bowler. Like, is he going to have a Hall of Fame vote now because he made yeah. the Pro Bowl? Like, <laughs> oh, goodness, ridiculous. 
But well, anyway, big cringe. But yeah, that's. I don't think I have any more. I don't either stuff to say about the Super Bowl. Do you? all I'm going to say is that that now means that Josh and I can truly focus on our first. Oh, it's draft. NFL draft season now, and we can NFL focus draft on season first. is full on. We know yes. the order. We know who all is declared. And we know Ben's is going to be the best uh, mock draft this year. We just we can you can sense it. I can't air. wait to see where we have all the quarterbacks going. Oh, dude, it's it might be it just might be the top like eight. Just might be just eight straight quarterbacks. Even guys that aren't in the first round. We're just like put them in there, just put them there. I can yeah. already tell you where I'm putting Michael Penix. I can tell you exactly where he's going to be drafted by and who. I feel like he'll be late first round, early second. We'll see because we only mocked the first. Well, I can tell you but what team. Don't tell me. I can tell you, all I'm going to say is, hint, he must like a lot of grub to eat. I think that's a perfect segue into our next topic. See? I know assistant what coaches that are, I shouldn't even say assistants. So, no, yeah. Ryan Grubb takes the OC job at Alabama. Yep. He daddles off to the NFL. Yep. Jeff Halfley skedaddles off to the NFL. Now, Bill O'Brien, who was your offensive coordinator, yes. takes that head coaching job, which salty. seems like a downgrade. But then all of a sudden, you get a you get a head coach willingly step away from a from a Big Ten program, take like a five million dollar pay cut, who had all the job security in the world. If you can finish with three straight winning seasons at UCLA, that's they're like heck yeah, well, man. And now yeah. Chip Kelly, we had our differences. Uh, well, not our differences, but we had our iffy opinions on Bill O'Brien. Wasn't yeah. the the home run hire you hoped? This but Chip Kelly, hire. like sh- you shattered it. This is the best <laughs> assistant coach hire because I didn't even realize he was. A candidate for an so, assistant coaching job. I do know that he was on the – he was going to – there was a chance he was going to get fired this year. If he doesn't win – like, I, I think if he doesn't win the bowl game, like, he does he does get fired. Now, the funny thing is that the AD of UCLA, he worked for Ohio State for five years, which is what this makes this whole thing just even more funny because it's just like – it just you can't write things like this. And then and then Chip Kelly was actually Ryan Day's head coach. Yeah, so he was when his he head played college he, football. No, it's no, it even makes it so he wasn't his head coach. He was so this is what happened. Fun fact: Ryan Day and Chip Kelly went to the same high school, not not at the same time, but they went to the exact same high school. Uh, Chip Kelly is the OC at New Hampshire. He recruits Ryan Day. Ryan Day plays for him as as obviously when he's the OC. Then when he becomes the head coach, he then becomes the – it's just a big circle. He's coached with him at the 49ers, at the Eagles. Like, Ryan Day has always been the assistant. Now, obviously, somehow the Ohio State – by the way, this is the most crazy part. Get You know what his buyout was from UCLA, Josh? Not much. One point like five million. million. Wasn't it? One point yeah, five just million. A million. When when have you ever seen a head coach of a top five league get a buyout for just a million? One point five million. It's Fifty it's million. Seventy million. So it's funny because obviously a day earlier, Michigan announces that they're getting uh, is that Wink Martindale or whatever his name is, and you know a, a defensive coordinator that coached for the Ravens. He's coached for the the Giants. And as you've said, you know a very we both have talked about different coordinators and we. I've, I know I will always believe that he's a very good defense coordinator. I just love how Ryan Day, like right after that goes, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to get Chip Kelly, which I truly believe that if Chip Kelly was more available, because I guess right after they hired uh, Bill O'Brien, Chip Kelly had started interviewing for offense coordinator jobs in the NFL. He had put his name out there. He had uh, interviewed for the Seahawks and a few other, few other places. And, it's funny because I think Ryan Day, I think in in his mind, always wanted Chip Kelly or like someone, you know, at, at, at that speed. And Bill O'Brien leaving, you know, we got screwed the first time by Boston College. This one might have been like we thought was going to be a screw job again, but this was almost like, hey, this gives you a second, you know, door opened. And Chip Kelly, this, you said it the best. This is a home run, right? Like this is a. It's incredible. You're, it's like you get a guy was, who's you, who's you a always genius. have like ten guys whose names get thrown around for every job opening, but it's like this is a guy. It's like and we joked about he it was last a week. candidate. I had we no joked idea about it. Was a candidate. And we joked yeah. about it last week. We're like, oh, they might like we've heard rumors that they might go after him. And yeah, it wasn't I thought like, that was just some troll on Twitter making it and up. It, and it, they didn't wait three or four weeks, Josh. This was like three days. Like Ryan Day knew as soon as he found out. I'm guessing he found out a few days before we found out Bill O'Brien was leaving. I'm sure he's like his first call was like, "Hey, hey, Chip, do you want to um, come make about two million less? And you don't have to worry about recruiting. 
You don't have to worry about any of that. All you got to do is run the office, which is what I've heard is what he's going to do. He's not going to worry about much recruiting, which is something that we heard Chip Kelly hates. He's hating the recruiting Chip part of Kelly, it. Yeah, the NIL. that's his biggest gripes with like all the all the college stuff is having to work in the portal as much as you have to at a program like UCLA and keeping guys on your roster with the NIL. And it's just he's definitely yeah. more interested in coaching the NFL, but he's already it, had his, I guess, one shot at it. And at college, it's. It's just not the same anymore. And it's a good time. It's all the rule changes. Yeah. And it's good timing for, for Chip Kelly because, uh, and for Ohio State because spring practices start in March. So it was good to get him in the building. Um, I kind of hate for UCLA who they just hired Foster. I think he's a former running back for them. Sean Foster promoted yet. But I just think it's a weird hire for your first time in the Big Ten. And you're like, hey, rookie head coach. Hey. Yeah. Very, very (laughs) underwhelming. But, Okay. UCLA, as I've said before on this show, does not care about football. Their they administration has they admitted do that do they don't really care about it. They don't and put a lot of effort Chip in. Kelly hated. Is, and that's what Chip Kelly hated. That they, they didn't, didn't really back care. him. They didn't do a whole lot to help him out. Uh, yeah, they they really care much more about their... UCLA is, actually is a, a lot like place, Michigan man. in this way, where just it's just like place. they... they it's like, oh, I have a UCLA degree. I have a Michigan degree, you know, and then we're Michigan men and we're UCLA men. It's like awesome. they, they just got they just got like that Ivy League attitude when they're not yeah. an Ivy League school. Yeah, it's kind of like a bunch of bunch of bunch of stuck up douchebags. Pretty much. Um, yeah. But this is the other thing, too, though, is is do you think that I, I don't think Michigan fans realize the the monster they have awakened in Columbus, Ohio? Like, I, I don't think. Like I've had so many Michigan fans like, oh, these are so, so hires. I'm like, do you realize that Chip Kelly is going to have at his disposal, he's going to have 2,000 yard rushers, a quarterback who is more than capable to run the ball and also throw the ball. You're going to have Jeremiah Smith, Jack, Jack Smith, uh, not Jack Smith, Jacob, but oh, goodness, Emeka Ibuka. You're going to have a offensive line that's going to be more veteran. Oh, by the way, he can just score as many points as he wants because he has a defense that is very good. Josh, if you're sitting there as Chip Kelly, why wouldn't you go to a place where you don't have to recruit? You get paid about two million a year, and you got that talent waiting for you. What else? Like, well, where else would you go? As much as I hate to see him at Ohio State, I am kind of curious to see this version of Chip Kelly. Doesn't have to worry about all the side stuff. Doesn't have to worry about being a, a head coach necessarily. He can focus on just. I guess what's gotten him head coaching jobs to begin with yeah. is that His offense creativity. he was running at Oregon that that made Oregon football like so popular and what got him the NFL job is just like Chip Kelly offense. Yeah, only has to focus on that. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be fun, and I think it's going to be fun to see Ryan Day finally get hands off of the offense and, and let then someone that do it. secondary too. Yeah, like Ryan Day only worrying about I guess everything else, right? Exactly. Not, not or. I shouldn't say everything else, but taking one thing off his plate yeah. now. And well, he, ha- he has being a-, a head coach. Well, and again, people are like, well, what is this going to do with Brian Hartline? I think Brian Hartline is going to love this. I think Brian Hartline, you, this is the perfect opportunity for you to have Chip Kelly mentor Brian Hartline and say, this is how you call plays. This is how you design an offense. Again, this is going to be Ryan's day offense with a Chip Kelly twist. That's what I've heard that, which I think is scary because Ryan day is already really good at offense. And you had Chip Kelly to that. Um, I think, you know, I'm very interested because he is seems to be more run heavy when he was at UCLA, which does worry me is can you keep the receivers happy enough is, <laughs> is now my worry a little bit. I think if you're but, winning, you're beating Michigan, you'll exactly. be happy. So uh, again, I, I'm very excited for Iowa state, but again, Josh, I'm going to go back to um, losing to Michigan three times, I think has w- uh, awakened a monster that awoken a monster that um, is uh, scary scary for opposing teams like imagine like just some of these like you know like nebraska's like oh we got our quarterback and it's like they look over to high state and they're like so what <laughs> like i just think that is that's gonna be fun well, it's just like hey the, what we've been doing lately isn't working we gotta we gotta take things up and, a notch and another thing is is uh if you want to fun find a fun fact that ben's predicting is that Rutgers might go 11 and 2 next year do you know that they do not play penn, penn state michigan Ohio State, Oregon, or Washington. They do not play any of those schools next year. I did hear that. They They're still literally I know that. But what I'm saying is they won nine games this year with a pretty hard schedule. 
and they have most of their guys coming back, which is, I'm just saying, again, I'm not, I, I think it would just be hilarious if that happened, but there's a good chance they could have a better record than Michigan, which is crazy. And also, how do you feel about Harbaugh just like depleting Michigan staff? I know they've made some good hires, but I just think it's hilarious that he's just like, peace, I'm taking everyone with me. <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly, I haven't even heard many Michigan fans talk negatively about it. I think yeah. they're they're taking they more of it. like the word. We're thankful for the the, the time you put in the national championship that we got, and it, yeah. I don't it, think any of them think that they're going to come back and repeat last year's success. I think they understand no, this is probably yeah. going to be more or realistically rebuild. an yeah. eight and four like stop gap where Sharon Moore is going to have to, I guess, get some get some guys in the building again because yeah. it's it's a different situation now. It is, but I am very excited for Chip Kelly, Josh. Also, I'm, I'm going to fix you again because or correct you, I should say, because Rutgers won seven games. I was games, like, there's sorry, no well, way they won nine, but still right. seven. That, in the I guess what East. I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I, I not that I, I, yes, I was wrong, but what I'm trying to say is that like they won games this year with like a very subpar team, and they had Michigan, Penn State, and yes. Ohio State on the but schedule. But you take those teams, and now because off. the divisions are getting scrapped, they don't exactly they got away with it. The only tough like game a big they have, 10 they West have, team. I think they have at Wisconsin and at USC. Are like the two tough games on their schedule, which is really and USC is kind of like looks like they could be seven or eight wins exactly too. Oh, well, that's Chip Kelly talk. Ryan Grubb, though, this is the one I was, I'm not going to say more shocked because, like I said, Chip Kelly, I didn't even realize was a candidate or even thinking of being an assistant yeah. coach and demoting himself. But Ryan Grubb gets the NFL job. I would have thought that being at Alabama, being with his boy, Kalen DeBoer, that was that was like going to be, you know, a, a duo there for a little while. And Maybe the uh... – well, NFL money, yeah. but also just not having to deal with all the college Recruiting, nonsense yeah. maybe has something to do with it too. But do you feel like we're going to lose coaches, by the way, because of that? Do you think more coaches are going to like try to get away from college? Oh, we already are losing a handful of I coaches know. to the NFL already. I think Nick Saban retired earlier than he would have had all these changes not happened. Jim yeah. Harbaugh goes to the NFL because he's tired of dealing with the NCAA and all this nonsense, and we see Grubb go, and we see Mac Brown Ashley go, and – how who, who? Mac Brown. How is Mac Brown? Mac still Brown. Yeah. Well, he was never in the NFL, anyways, and I think he's like just past past just that window. He's just old. Yeah. Yeah. So Grub going was interesting too. I thought. Uh, also interesting hire. Alex Grinch still keeps getting jobs. Ben. He's how? on the staff at Wisconsin now. How? How does that man? How do you trust that man with anything on defense? Is beyond me. We've seen him at Ohio State. We've seen him at Oklahoma. We've seen Sucked him at USC. Never was good. It's like you guys realize there's other coaches out there, or you could there's go and get somebody else that I don't know. Like James Orr Nice is technically still a grad assistant. Like you at least try to throw money at him and try to get him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least. Goodness. Yeah. Got me, man. Uh maybe uh do you know if Fickle and Grinch were together at Ohio State? I do I think Fickle left be they might have maybe crossed paths like for a year, maybe, but I, I think it was a very, if it was brief time, I don't think they like spent a ton of time together. I have heard the whole Vrabel thing to Wisconsin is just weird to me. Like, I don't Vrabel think Vrabel, going to college. I don't think, I don't think he wants to go back. He left college. He left Ohio State because he hated recruiting. Like, he hated recruiting. He, I do think his style of coaching would fit college really well, just the way that. Do this you is think it's the, true, though? Do you think it's true about him? The, the, his stature? Do you think that's like a true fact? I don't think it's a stature. I've I've heard this criticism of at least him in the NFL is that he runs his guys into the ground too much, which is why the Titans always seem to have more injuries than everybody else. You can't coach them that way in the NFL. You can coach that way in college, but in the NFL you've got millions of dollars invested in these guys, and you can't necessarily yeah. do that. Um, the way that he'll talk to players, I guess, isn't a way that you is a way that you can more so talk to college kids than pros, and guys don't really like that all that much, although. Will Compton and Taylor Wan have nothing but high praise for Mike Vrabel, and they were in that locker room. So yeah, it's it's only two guys, but still, those are still former players that didn't have any beef with him. So it's just I'm kind of shocked that Vrabel never got in the NFL. Even like I don't even think they've really talked about even like assistant hires or anything like yeah. that in the league. I'd I'd take him as a DC or like a a position coach or something like that. But maybe he has his mindset on being an NFL head coach, and yeah. he's not going to settle. It's weird. It's a weird, yeah. weird roar. Oh, man. Uh, nothing else has really big happened in college football lately, right? No, nothing. Not, not really much in sports generally, at least outside of 
yeah. outside of with the Super Bowl. We got, I think, NBA All Star Weekend this week. Yeah. But we've already aired our grievances about yeah, we, we, what All Star Weekend is anymore. It. So I don't think there's really anything no. else to add. No, and, and I mean pitchers and catchers reported. So I mean, you you have those. You know, we are in spring training. We still don't yeah. have Matt Chapman, Jordan Montgomery. Cody Bellinger or Blake Snell on well, it's, rosters. It's also because Blake Snell wants like eight years, like a hundred nine, two hundred some million. Like, well, dude, I was, was about to bring that. up the one common denominator there is all of them are Scott Boris clients. Oh, that's that's that's. And that's, we've seen past Scott Boris clients go wait like until season, literally man. like the week before opening day, or yeah, even like mid season to sign a contract because it just seems like eventually teams cave. I just don't think they're going to cave this year. I think a lot of teams like their young guys, and I don't think they're willing to like sacrifice their whole mortgage and, and, Joey, Votto, and Joey Votto doesn't have a team yet either hmm. not a Scott Boris client no I said no <laughs> Tre- I mean, yeah. Trevor Trevor Bauer did come out and say he said look I will play for incentives only and it's no risk which Josh and I both believe that he's I already been cleared he's, by the courts why is he, so not that means he never did anything to begin with so why are no. you like trying to distance yourself there's nothing to worry about because nothing happened like he literally went to Japan and he pitched and, in Japan so he's been active and he also pitched with under a three ERA in Japan, which, by the way, is not an easy place to pitch. People think it is. It's not. It's good. It's a good spot. Yeah. Um. So, a couple things uh, that we can add to. Jorge Soler is one of those other big names that's off the free agent market now. Signs with the Giants. Three years, $42 million. We've seen the Giants try to take some big swings on some They've free agents. We've seen, him, we've seen him fail on Judge. We've seen him fail on Correa. We've seen him they fail on Japanese Yamamoto. Guy. But they got Soler, and Soler, Ben, was one of 10 players last year to hit over 30 home runs and have an OBP over 340. He also could be the first Giant since 2004, Barry Bonds, to hit 30 home runs in a season. Does he, How is wild he is t- that? Is he going to take steroids? or? Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is that, sorry. Is that sensitive? I don't I read that. I was like, I cannot believe the Giants haven't had a – Guy because hit 30 home because runs. it's the thing, their first baseman for so many years was Brandon Belt, who hit like 18 home runs as a first baseman. Like that was their first baseman. They Even never had still, a power like Pablo bop. Sandoval was a giant. He never, but he I always mean, hit like never 20. a power hitter, but still, a, like 30 is not super hard to get Dude, anymore. It, how are lefties not hitting the ball out of that ballpark? Have you seen how like friendly the, being a lefty in the McCovey Cove balls go in the water all the time? And yet, dude. Uh, but yeah, I sorry I brought sorry Brandon Bell. I don't know why I bashed him, but it's just like <laughs> he was always the first baseman. Whenever I played like MLB the show, that like every other first baseman in the league gets like twenty five to forty home runs, and then you have Brandon Belt gets like twelve. It's like how are you a starting first baseman playing one hundred forty games and you get fourteen home runs? Yeah, this is a team that Mind won two or three World Series there in the mid two thousands too, and I forget that it was mostly just like the pitching that was the reason. Yeah, Having Matt Lincecum. Kane and Tim Linson come Dude, and Tim Lincecum, Madison man. Bumgarner. Dude, what yeah. a freak Tim Lincecum was. That whole like, oh, dude, that that era. But no, they had yeah. Barry Zito, man. Barry Zito. That was my guy. <laughs> lefty right. Barry Zito. Threw about, Zito threw about 85 miles yeah. now. Brian Wilson, the closer with the big beard and acted weird. And he always like did for... this. He'd always like cross yeah. his arms. Be like that after every save. Dude, we're yeah. aging ourselves, man. I know that's not a long time. It is actually a long time. That's a decade ago. That was 2012, 14, 16. Dude, we are, they won we World are, Series. We are aging ourselves. Honestly, it is It is truly about. Imagine telling your kids, hey, when I was a kid, the Giants <laughs> did have a guy hit 30 home runs in a season. The, Do- the Giants were actually good. Um, <laughs> and that, too, in general. The Giants were actually good once. Um, I did also see Shohei Otani in his first batting practice. Dude, that swing is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It is a beautiful swing, but I think people are overreacting to 10 home runs in batting practice. People don't realize that batting practice, they're throwing the That's ball That's what like batting practice is for. If you aren't hitting a home run in batting practice, what are you, you doing? You suck. Yeah, <laughs> complete trash. Um, I but do. Think, he's only getting two million dollars this season. I do so. think Josh and I. You can let us know in the comments. Do you believe Josh and I should join Banana Baseball? I think Josh and I on the Savannah Bananas would be phenomenal. Oh my gosh, we would have so much fun. You know we would. We should be the Doing commentators. What? We should just be the. We should just be the commentators. And I, say, I feel like you still got to be able to hit a baseball. Somewhere. I can't hit Some a ball. I can't hit a, you do realize I played baseball for like 14 years. So I, if I you're throwing talented. like 70 mile an hour to me, I might be okay. But still, dude, if John Cena can go out anything and play faster a game, then we can. That's true. Maybe we can tell the script writers for the, the Savannah bananas. Hey, make sure the ball bounces off my bat <laughs> like this far. 
<laughs> Better yet, give me like let me hit a bouncy ball or a golf ball. <laughs> Just make it look like a baseball. Yeah. Make it I, a CGI a baseball on it. So let us know. Uh, make sure you tag Savannah Bananas below. And if they could come to a game in Europe and bring Josh with them, we could do a whole podcast thing with Savannah Bananas. I'm just saying. Hmm. Um, but anyways, Josh, you have anything else to share? Or, uh, do you think we've just calculated out today? I think we're I think we've pushed the buttons. Today. Uh, we've, we've probably I think covered all the bases today. I'm, I'm still running through my head right no now. No pun intended. Anything. No pun intended. I I can't recall anything. No uh, no other changes that I can think that really That's need true. to be talked about. Nothing in soccer, right? Not really. It's like in the middle of the year, so there's not really anything crazy. There will be the World Cup though coming up uh, in two years, I think, right? Yeah, Euros are this. The Euros are this summer, so we'll talk about the Euros. All right, so summer. no soccer will be played until two years when the World Cup happens. <laughs> Got it. No soccer oh, that's Jared's worth talking about on this show. Oh, he's gonna be offended <laughs> so much. No, um, honestly, um, I haven't followed this. How has Messi's impact in the MLS been? Uh, or- I mean, they uh, chi- uh, China got mad at him um and uh, China did. and and yeah taiwan got mad at him uh basically like they told like the organizers of chinese taipei i think that's where they were i don't remember whether taiwan i i don't know where they were exactly but supposedly they got offended because they said the day before he played like two days before and then they're like oh he's gonna suit up and play you know and everyone shows up you know they sell out a stadium for inter miami because they're doing scrimmages like you know preseason games and they show up and he's in street clothes and the event organizers didn't know that. And like the government of China is like ticked off. The government of Chinese of Taiwan is just like really mad. So yeah, that's the impact he's having is he's making China hate us. Making so. China hate us. Okay. Well, I, I got to say I'm, I'm all of a sudden the world's biggest messy fan right now <laughs> because I'm all about that kind of stuff. Welcome. Also, am, am I uh, am I off or am I correct that the Daytona 500 is either like this weekend or next weekend? Yeah, it's it's something coming up. We just we never talk. Maybe about they racing, didn't do it so. on the same weekend as NBA All Star Weekend, but probably not. It's got to be coming up. That is true. Let's well, anyways, see. I think it is. I'm about to check the schedule right now. Okay, Daytona 500 this is the 18th, so yeah, this week. So you know what? Two thirty. So all, you'll get to watch you... that. You'll get to watch the 500, and then you'll get to watch the All-Star game in the evening. I don't know what's more entertaining, cars going around in circles or a terrible All-Star game. Um, Don't know. It's pretty close to the same. (laughs) Going to be honest. (laughs) Pretty close to the same. Um, I just like to watch the 500 highlights for the Rex. I'm sorry. That is terrible human being, but uh, that's where I am. Um, Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this chaotic episode. It started out great, and then we just kind of declined as the uh, episode went on. But hey, I guess everybody decided to wait to do anything until after the Super Bowl. That so this true. whole week is just like nothing's gonna. You're not allowed to trade anybody. You're not allowed to make any nothing. cuts. You're not allowed to. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, no injuries allowed. Exactly. Anyways, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode of the podcast. If you've been listening on. Uh, watching i should say on youtube go ahead and click that thumbs up button hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell let us know that you're enjoying it comment below what are you more excited about the daytona, daytona 500 or the nba all-star game let us know below uh and if you've loved listening to us on spotify or podcast make sure you like and share it and favorite it or everything you do on there i lose track and uh also i hope you guys have a great relaxing weekend in the end of the week here coming up and as always We'll see ya.